So I'm Will Matthews, and I just want to thank you guys. I, this is such a privilege to, to be having important conversations um, that people just aren't having. It seems like in our, in our culture, sometimes it's a lot easier to find things that we agree on and just stay there, but not really touch the heart of issues that are important. And um, it, is, it is really important for us to, um, for us all to dive in and 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 have some important conversations. So this is a this is a four event journey. Um, the first event was two weeks ago, um, and we had a wonderful time. We really talked about the awakening, which is stage one. We put together an, uh, a journey of equity from awakening, which is starting to realize that there's something going on. Um, that's different about specifically about race and um and equity in the workplace in our lives with our relationships and goes all the way to becoming an advocate and that's somebody who is that's somebody who is out there pressing for equitable policies structures um ideas conversations and pushing and pushing forward in the relationship to make room for everybody and um, and today, what we're going to do is we're going to go deep into awareness, um, which which is stage two. And an awareness is is when is when somebody begins to see what is going on out there in America, in the workplace, in their lives, in their suburban lives, wherever they are living, and they're saying, and, and they're saying that. I have got to make a change. Maybe I don't know exactly what to do, but I know that I need to begin to talk to people inside of my, inside of my ecosystem, inside of my, my group, and, and find out how, how I actually walk the walk and take the journey of equity. And I, I love this quote um, by the diversity advocate, Verna Meyer, that says, diversity is being invited to the party inclusion is being asked to dance so we're gonna go we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go into that and why we're here today is uh a couple of months ago when george floyd was murdered the america was confronted with the fact that there's something going on in our society in the structures that we have we have built we've allowed uh structures that we have turned our back on and, and, and structures that we perpetuated that makes it, that makes, that makes our society continually perpetuate inequality. And with that, I, I was, I was overwhelmed. I, I went to some, uh, I, I went to some protests, I, I started reading, I, but I, there was something inside. And I reached out to my friends over at Notley and I was like, what are you guys doing? And a really cool thing happened is they asked me what I was doing. And I said, you know what, I wanna have conversations with business leaders so that we can walk forward as a community into having a more equitable, uh, a more equitable workplace. And they rallied behind me and we put together these four events that uh, will illuminate how to do that. And I tell you today, this is just the, the beginning this is just conversations. There's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of dynamics. And, um, and we're going to work to get you the tools that you need to, uh, to make that happen. And, and guys, if you have a question, if you see something, uh, it, some stuff that's burning on your heart that you, that you want to ask our, our panelists today, please put it in the chat box. Um, we're going to have some time at the end to go through those questions and and um, and and get to the heart of the matter. And what has happened from from the time of George Floyd is to now is I feel America is asking, business leaders are asking, influencers are asking, they are asking, what do we do now? And that is a complicated question, but I believe that conversations with people from different backgrounds starts a dialogue that will that will create a tide that will make change where it needs to be changed 
And so with that, I want to welcome our incredible panelists. I'm so excited to have you guys here um, um, to, just, to just chat some of the life experiences of these guys and, and the real awakening to their position and their advocacy inside of business is, has been inspiring. And so we're going to, we're going to get these guys, we're going to ask some questions. We're going to, we're going to go deep and, and, and it's okay to be scared. <laughs> it's okay to not know what to say. Um, it's okay to not have the perfect answer for every single thing. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a journey together and um, hopefully people leave this, leave this call today and this round table inspired to take those next steps. And I wanna welcome Dan Graham, co-founder and partner over at, at Notley. Um, they're doing some really incredible things uh, with, with what they've been given um, and taking personal wealth and infusing it into a community to help give to help to help give that extra fire to nonprofits and and organizations around the central Texas, and and broad and Trey Hardy, a friend Olympian. This guy is a absolute monster and just great, great human. And um, the way he has seen and the way he has seen life has seen life and the way he is seeing life. And his journey to to becoming an advocate is such a special thing. And Sam, um, this guy is this guy is 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 just real, is raw, and coming from a commercial real estate background and being able to see that there is not that much diversity inside that community, and and really walking into that with heart on the sleeve and just just going after it. I I do appreciate it. So let's 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 uh let's welcome these guys and um where are you guys at let's get you up here and so dan where you at, man? i'm here okay dan so tell me about what you're seeing in our community now um like what kind of conversations are you having with other business leaders, um, with other CEOs behind closed doors about race? Um, are they talking? What, what's going on back there? You know, I think there's most of the reaction is still kind of centered on, you know, how to respond to employees um, and, and clients or customers and is sort of very much either whether it's internal or external is kind of through a PR lens, I think, you know, so it's how do we do something quickly, but that will, um, you know, that, that also is going to allow them to advance their business mission. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of the context is from the business side is very much still kind of thinking about this from a, um, you know, kind of a self-preservation type type mentality. So there's a lot of questions around like, can we bring in consultants? Can we do DEI work internally? Um, is, where do we donate? Who do we sponsor? Um, how do we get our name out there on uh, on pledges or open letters um, to to be public facing to show that you know we we support uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, racial justice, and social equity. Um, and then I think too, there's just a lot of shock that this is not contained to some far flung city. You know, they released the Ramos video yesterday or the day before, which is, which happened this year in Austin where our police murdered a black man. And, um, I think there's still disbelief that Austin is part of the systemic problem as well. Uh, but a little bit of like not sure what to do beyond, you know, kind of putting some money in different places and bringing in a consultant. Is it Dan? Is it is it is it going down past the um, the bottom line of and the PR into like 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 people like like personally connecting with these issues? I think people legitimately care. Um, I don't know that it's you're seeing. I don't think you're seeing people making business decisions that aren't keeping the bottom line and 
in mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that that's, I think on a personal level they care, but they're also still trying to make decisions that are in the best interest of their company. Yeah. And if you were talking to business, to other business leaders right now, what, what would your push be? Yeah, it's, it's beyond kind of, you, you know, I, I, I feel like a lot of the action that's being taken feels sort of like when people, when polluters buy carbon offset credits. Mm. And so it's sort of like, well, we have these racial issues, so where can we just donate to sort of like make it go away? As opposed to really looking internally and looking at the demographics of their team, of their C-suite, of their board, mm. and then actually doing things to fix that on kind of a foundational level. So that's where I would push is, hey, let's move away from where can you sponsor or donate to, okay, you've got seven out of seven white guys at your C-suite. Mm -hmm. How do you get that to 50-50 men, women, or bringing in uh, people of color onto the C-suite? What's the step, what are the steps you're actually gonna take to get there within 12 months? And how do you start executing against that? Because that's where it's really uncomfortable. When you start having to look at your team and, and asking the, the performers that you have on board to give up kind of their positions of power or their privilege, that's when sort of people run away. And so I think that's like, but that's where the, I think long-term um, the real change has to happen. Yeah, I know um, before we were talking about the Reddit um, board leader who stepped down in, uh, in favor of, of a person of color to take that position. Is that what we need is, do we need more people saying, I'm gonna step down and give my position up so that we can have the change that we need? I think that gets you there a lot faster than waiting for someone to retire or, or die or whatever to get that seat uh, at the table. Um, you know, I think a lot of companies are trying to create new seats so they don't have to, mm -hmm you know, swap somebody out. They're like, oh, we now have a, you know, a chief whatever position, which is great. Um, but I just think it just takes a long time if you're sort of waiting for all the, you know, the white people to sort of leave on their own. But <laughs> it's sort of like, yeah. you know, who's going to give up privilege, right? So it's, it's a hard, it's a hard thing. I, and even the Reddit founder, like he's richer than probably all of us put together. And but so it's, what is he actually giving up? But I think it was a, I think it was a strong statement, um, mm -hmm. for sure. Hey Sam, um, you're working in the in the commercial real estate world, um, and I'm that's my background as well. I didn't see many much diversity inside of that space. Um, Tell me about your experience there. I know in the heat of right after George Floyd, you 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 took to LinkedIn and 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 actually was was vocal about your stance and kind of seeing the divide in there. Tell me tell me about your experience in this in that community. Yeah, I think the the thing that stands out to me is, you know, I grew up in the sticks. <laughs> When I went to UT, I learned what a polo shirt was. And so I started wearing polos and dressed like a white frat guy. And I wanted to point that out because um, when I started trying to seek out diversity and hiring, like my first junior partner was a um, awesome Hispanic guy. And you start seeing these systemic issues where he was one of the hardest working people I've ever met, invaluable part of the team. But when you're like, hey, man, we got a golf tournament to go to, he's like ghosting. And I'm like, why are you ghosting? And I talked to him and he's like, I've never been to a golf tournament. So I was like, come on, man, we're going to go to Golfsmith. I bought him golf clubs, bags, shirts, shoes. And I reminded him the most important thing about a golf tournament is just make sure you've got, you know, something for other people to drink, cigars and music, and they don't care how you hit the ball. <laughs> um, and then we had a quail hunt. He did the same thing. And I was like, dude, we gotta, you got, you're part of the team. You need to come out. And it really started dawning on me how there's so many things that are systemic in real estate that people don't recognize because they're like, well, this is just what you do. And you've been trained since you're a 
kid to, you know, younger, you know, to wear boots and blue jeans and go shoot stuff, you know, and it's like, but it, these things are like foreign concepts to some people. They've never gone out, you know, the first time I went and shot clays, I was in a t-shirt and shorts and some like nice loafers I picked up at Goodwill and I show up and all the other white guys are like dressed totally different. And so the next time I like went shopping and came back out and I looked like everybody, you know, and I think that there's two things about that statement that bother me. One is how homogenous not only the dress code is <laughs> and how people look on their skin and also in their blue shirts, you know, don't wear pink. Um, but also how the system is structured from the very time you get in to where, you know, internships aren't paid. <laughs> they don't give you like a professional allowance. You got, you know, clients or friends of friends referring their, you know, kids or other people. And mm -hmm. over time, what that does is it just creates an industry with enormous barriers to entry. And one of the things about my LinkedIn was just kind of a trying to address that is that, you know, overnight, you're not going to have somebody that has a decade or 15 years of experience in real estate development. Yeah. But right now where you can actually start making changes is by kind of training that next generation or giving people opportunities. And um, that was just kind of my experience from like a worldview watching these things that were a little bit off. And even when I started trying to find you know, juniors or other people that didn't look like me, it was almost impossible. And I had to go and search them out. Um, and they turned out to be star players. But um, speaking to kind of my experience in the commercial real estate world, I think that most people can identify that when they look around and everybody at the cocktail hour or boardroom or in a deal space from your attorneys to your engineers <laughs> to your contractors all looks the same. So, but that like Dan was saying, it doesn't change overnight. And sometimes yeah. it takes being real thoughtful on the front end because, you know, I was an intern 15, 16 years ago. And yeah. when I hired my first black intern, I just was blunt. I said, man, I have always thought about how if I was black, I may not have been invited by my buddy to Austin Country Club to have a hamburger, even though I thought it was Austin Community College. And I didn't understand why we were going there. Um, and that kind of changed the trajectory of my life, but you know, that's kind of my do. So when you posted that, um, behind the scenes inside the community, was there a cringe? Did you get any feedback from, from other commercial, commercial guys? What, what was going on back there where people, where nobody sees, you know, one of the things that, George Floyd, rest in peace. <laughs> I mean, that dude's doing backflips in heaven because it, for the first time, I feel like there was no discussion around, was this right or wrong? <laughs> I mean, th there wasn't like this side, that side. And so what I was actually really encouraged by is the amount of people, yourself included, that had reached out to me and were like, hey, thanks for doing that. Like, and how many people just said, we don't even know where to start <laughs> like myself. Like I, I didn't know what to do. I've got this one story and I'm like, I'm going to say it because that I saw that it worked. And if everybody else is like me, it's like, you want to help. You want to have a conversation. You don't know where to start. You don't know what to do. And you know, to Dan's point, you're not asking somebody to step down from a board seat, but you may be hiring the intern for 1250 and giving them a professional allowance. Like, yeah anybody can do that right and unfortunately it's it's a low barrier to entry but a decade from now that will have major implications on the c-suite in real estate and so um i got a lot of people that reached out to me and i had probably a dozen conversations off that one post and you know the people that may have who fought at it it no longer it's not in vogue to be like oh there's not an issue we're all white and that's okay it's like no there's there's some issues. What do we do about it? And so, you know, a couple of managing directors and other friends that I've had that we were all interns together back in the day, were reaching out talking about how they could, you know, go about making changes. So I, I was actually, you know, as terrified as I was about posting that, and even I told you this, Will, getting on calls and talking about these issues, yeah. I think that the response was probably completely different than I would have gotten three, four years ago, because I've thought about that for 
four years saying something. And I just never had the guts. I, I think with commercial real estate too, there's, you know, there's two, only two ways to make money. Either you're a limited partner and you have a ton of money that you're putting into these deals. Usually yeah. there's minimums or you're on the general partner side, in which case that's just like gifted equity for being part of the project. And so I think like the gifted equity pieces where commercial real estate companies can have a big impact because they're just, they sit at a table at the beginning of every deal and they sort of just chop up all the general partner equity. Um, sometimes you put some money in, but usually a lot of times you're just sweat equity. And so at that point is how you can, I think without a lot of pain, give opportunity to, to people who otherwise wouldn't have a chance at the table. But usually that's your friends, your, your network, um, you know, pe people you've done deals with in the past who have cut you in on deals in the past. And so it's, uh, it's usually a bit of a closed group, but that's where the real upside is in commercial real estate. Yeah. Yeah. My fourth year, that's what happened to me, Dan. I started, I was an intern and I started getting small pieces of these things. Right. So, <laughs> so Trey, I want to, oh, you, you've had an interesting, an interesting connection to this change. Uh, I've, I've had the privilege to, to be friends with Trey and we, we are talking pretty regularly about these kinds of things. Trey is also a ex athlete for the university of Texas. So there is the behind the scenes of, of what those guys are doing to create a better space at the university. Um, and really Trey is forging a path into business and in, in, um, in some really, in really great, great ways. Trey, can you tell me about what you have been learning and kind of your awakening? We talked about um, white fragility and just some of those things. Tell me about your, your, yeah, your journey. Yeah. Um, it, I don't, I don't want to take up everybody's time. It's a long journey and it's, and it's an ongoing process, but mm -hmm. it's a, it, it, to sum it up, to it's bumper sticker. This is, it's a painful reeducation. And I think of that, um, it, it kind of is like the microcosm at the C-suite and the board level that Dan talked about is, is what goes on internally as well. You have this thing on its face and you start to, to peel back the layers of the onion and deconstruct uh, the world that you created around yourself. And then um, this all you know, brought about by the impetus in, in late May and June and, and everything that's going on in the world. It, it, it just caused me to, to kind of want to do something about it and learn more about what was, what was actually going on. Not what I, what I, you know, not chosen to ignore up until that point. Um, I've lived a, a fantastic life. I grew up in a little tiny bubble town, um, outside of Birmingham, Alabama. I, I took Alabama history. I took world history, U S history. I thought I knew everything there was to know about, everything you know i got a really really good education uh i ran track track is a prim primarily black sport i was a sprinter I, I did the decathlon i went to mississippi state uh surrounded myself with black friends transferred to texas again same situation although austin is a little less diverse than starkville mississippi um and and coasted through my 20s made some olympic teams was voted i was a team captain of team usa um, by my peers, um, thought life was good. Everybody's like, you're good. We're good. We're all on the team. Cool. High, high fives. Like in, in school, it was, you're on scholarship. I'm on scholarship. Everybody's equal. Um, and, and just coasting through that, thinking everything's cool. We're good. Everyone had the same circumstances and did the same things to get here. And life to me was this meritocracy. Um, and in, in doing that and seeing the world that way, not only was I almost under right, like to denying my white privilege, but I was also denying the existence of, of race and disparity and injustice. And, and then not overtly, not, this wasn't something in my heart that, that we would, you know, call today, you know, racist or ill intended. This was just something that I was just, I was raised to be colorblind which now during this time in my life, I'm, that's not how I'm gonna raise my children. I'm gonna raise them to understand the difference between people's perspectives and, and everything that they've gone through and how that's different than you because you know, I'm gonna tell my little girls, you're white, 
the world's going to look at you a lot different. Here's how our people came to this country. Here's how that, those people came to this country. And here's what they've been through and teach them the actual real history and how colorblindness is not, it, it's not the way to go. It, it shouldn't exist. Um, I, I was denying the, the, the struggle and denying the existence of the systems that, that made it a struggle and that keep it a struggle. And so for me, as I, as I stand today, you know, I'm not, I've founded a few companies over the last couple of years. I've been involved with some interesting business stuff um, since I retired from the sport three years ago. But uh, for me moving forward, this is just about continuing that education and continuing these conversations um, and having that incredibly uncomfortable and difficult conversation within myself first um, so that I can provide myself with the grace and and forgiveness of who I was so that I can move forward in the right direction and begin to ask for grace and forgiveness to the, to the people in my, that I'm closest to. So that, that's the bumper sticker. The bu that is, I mean, that's a nice bumper sticker. And behind the scenes, like with text chats, with, with other friends, uh, um, people who may not have quickly understood or at least been willing to take that journey. What is, what does that look like in how have you given, how have you, well, uh, led them? Um, one of the things I'm, I'm really excited about and, and fortunate to be a part of is the University of Texas Athletic Alumni. Um, we set out at the very beginning, for those that, any, that followed it all, um, the, a few football players from the University of Texas issued a statement demanding changes to, to the names of buildings, the removal of Confederate statues. Um, they asked to stop singing the eyes of Texas and remove it as the school's alma mater, um, made several demands um, that they felt represented systemic uh, and racial injustice. Uh, so a lot of us got together. I say a lot of us, there's, you know, several thousand UT alumni, but we have a core group of a couple of hundred that are, that are involved and even a smaller core group of about nine to 12 that are, have touch points on the university now um, to support the student athletes, to create a decentralized, unaffiliated alumni support group that, would, that, showed, that, would, that wanted to show up and let everybody on campus know, like everybody that was basically Will and myself 15 and 20 years ago, that we, we hear them, yeah, <laughs> that we hear, we hear them and we understand how difficult it is first and foremost to be a student athlete. Um, the demands that are placed on you um, are, are harder than the demands to, that, of just normal students. I don't care if you have a job or an internship, it's, it's hard to be a student athlete. And we empathize with them and their feelings toward the school stances on a lot of that stuff while at the same time they were being asked to represent them as the biggest marketing money maker the world has ever seen. It's a hundred million dollar a year revenue, like billion dollar franchise that all of a sudden the employees said, Hey, we got a problem and everybody shot them down and on social media. So we formed this group and in the subsequent month um, we've had several uh, calls with the athletic director, Chris Del Conti, We've spoken to every single coach, except for we haven't spoken to one of them, but every single coach, we've had one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls to ask how we can help, how we can support them. Because if you, if you look online, you can see the division. You can see people on one side of the, the argument and one side of the other. The teams were the same way. You know, a lot of people had a lot of different meaning tied to a lot of things. And um, teams were being torn apart from the inside out. And it's hard as a coach for them to step in and say, hey guys, let's all get together. But as a you know, decentralized, unaffiliated alumni group, we can step in and help them bridge that gap and facilitate those conversations and create opportunities for inclusion and promotion and uh, connecting people with, with Sam or Dan. Like, hey, if you're interested in commercial real estate, if you really wanna get into this like multifamily stuff, if it piques your interest, we can make those connections um, in a more effective way than you know, a slow moving, bureaucratic institution like UT athletics. And behind the scenes, what is the, what's the result of that? Where, where's this moving? I mean, cause all of us out here, um, see what the news, 
what's on the news and and basically the the changes and and the field changing and stuff like that but um is there any sort of change to create space for the for the athlete to have a better voice and are those relationships between coach and player and player and player moving forward in in in, a, in an equitable way very much so the from the very first moment we spoke to the athletic director, he jumped on board and said, build it, I'll cut you the check. Build it and let me know what you need. We need this like yesterday, help us, help us do this. And so then as we spoke to each and every coach, it was, thank God, here's what we do right now. Here's how we see you can fit in and, and add to what, we're, what we currently do. In addition, just be present and show up. If I need you, I'd love for you to, to, to stop by. And on the student athlete side, it's been hard from, for COVID, like with, with digital everything and kids not even knowing if, they have, if they're gonna be on campus right now. And so for us in students, those conversations are actually starting tomorrow. We're actually going to be sitting in on team meetings starting tomorrow um, to talk to the kids exactly about what we're doing. Um, we didn't want to cross that line and breach, you know, step over the coaches to just jump in and start talking to the kids. We wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page. And so those conversations start tomorrow. But right now there is uh, heightened enthusiasm for what we're building, um, for having these conversations. Like all the coaches said during their team meetings, kids are just sitting there. They're, they're crying with one another. They're on Zoom just crying, wishing they could, you know, hold one another as they share their stories and learn more about each other. And, and those are building and fostering deep, deep connections and relationships that otherwise wouldn't have been there. Yeah. Dan, um, uh, one of the things that Trey said that was interesting was cut the check. Um, and when I hear that, I'm hearing people in influential um, positions not knowing maybe not knowing what to do but having money um how can you how can you see in in the business world in austin like if um what could money do to push things forward yeah you know i mean i think i mean if all if all you could do is write a check great like if you've got the budget but mm -hmm. you don't have any influence beyond that great i mean that's better than doing doing nothing you know when when uh when trey was talking and about kind of the list of demands or the list of asks that the the players are coming up with my mind was going toward well, what what do you act what would it actually take to remove the the song or remove the statues and how where does that have to go that's probably not a decision for the athletic director to make so who's the person that has to make that decision is that the ultimately the board of regents which means it's the governor and is that more of a political decision and how do you direct the money or the influence or the leverage from the athletic director to those political positions to put pressure on them to make those changes that, Hey, we actually don't want slaveholders idolized via statues on our campus or whatever it is. Um, and, and so like, what's the money is, is the money just to fund the, the gatherings and the Zoom calls and the lunches to talk about this stuff? Or is it being used in furtherance of like an outcome goal? And how do you kind of apply that leverage on a step-by-step -step basis to achieve those, those results, which is not always straight, straightforward. Like how, does, how, does, how do athletes and alum actually make changes on a university level? I mean, it's a giant bureaucracy. And so is that, and maybe that's political donations, maybe it's lobbying, maybe it's putting people on the front of the newspaper to make them feel bad about the, the lack of, of decisions that they're making, I, you know? So I would always try to apply it, the money and the, and, the, and the time and the effort toward, you know, how, what's the ultimate change we're trying to make and what are the steps we actually need to do to get there? And so it sounds like you were saying like, it, it, is, it, is, it is, of course, it is, it is about the money. So if we're bringing this back to like the Austin business ecosystem, of course it is, it is, it is a money is a part of the strategy, but it is a larger strategy to move this forward. How do you, how, how do you create empathy and how do you put people in the right places who, who can create a strategy that, that, that are actually touching those touch points? I think it's a snowball kind of a thing. You know, if you're a, CEO 
and uh, and you're kind of sitting around looking at your 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 white reports and your your white board, and you're sitting there going, "How do I change the culture of my organization?" If it hasn't occurred to you that you can make staffing decisions to impact that, and the only thing you're thinking is, "Well, what if we took some of our marketing budget and applied it over here?" Then I, I just don't think. I, you know, I think like having discussions and realizing you can actually make deeper decisions with the authority that you have and the advocate advocacy leverage that you have is, is a first step um, that a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of leaders don't think about in their first pass because they're used to thinking about solving problems just with a check and with a budget and saying, well, how much can my company afford to spend on this this year and still maintain its profitability goals? Um, and so I, th I think there is a whole nother level of leverage that we can all employ that for just maybe out of routine and habit or, or years of not doing it, it just doesn't naturally occur to us, even though it might be pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. And how, and how do we, I mean, as people begin to walk down that, that journey, um, and we know that there's a competitive advantage with having diversity inside of your organization, um, new markets, um, better employee engagement. Like there's, there, there are things, um, how, how do we, how do we continue to, to grow those ideas inside of our, inside of our community, um, in the business and then outside? I mean, I think once you start bringing diverse perspectives onto your team and bringing mm -hmm. them, bringing them to the party and asking them to dance, they're, you know, like they're going to add that perspective just naturally. And suddenly more and more of your decisions start to incorporate those diverse perspectives, opinions, and people start pointing things out more. They, their, their networks are brought to the table as well. It gets easier. Um, you know, once, once you make the decision to start on that, on that path. Dan, um, um, Sam, Sam, I'd like to go over to Sam. Sam, Inside of a community where it's going to take a long time to get more diversity inside of, inside of the space, what can you do right now and what kind of advice would you give people inside of these kind of siloed communities that are just all white? Yeah, I, th I think going back to something that Dan said, as well as regarding the silo, like I've been real fortunate to help co-found and back up to very diverse CEOs. And at the tech company Transect that I co-founded, we're 58% minority and female. And at I Care, the behavioral health firm, it's 85% minority and female. And when Dan said it gets easy, it's like one's got 17 employees, one's got 75 now. It stacks so fast. And I think that people, particularly myself, before I became we jokingly call me the token white guy at board meetings at I care <laughs> before, before I sat in a team and saw how these different perspectives interacted. And I saw the innovation that came out of it. I didn't get it. You know, as, as white guys, we've got this like patriarchal, like my way or the highway style of negotiation. Let's just call it what it is being an asshole. <laughs> that that you don't really recognize until you get into a situation with other people and they have a whole different way of going about things, right? And I think that that style of leadership management negotiations, frankly, comes from, you know, for 6,000 years, being in a position of power that just gets ingrained in your system, right? And so you don't really understand like other people and what they add to the process because you just think that, well, you're right. And so I think that the biggest thing that I learned about helping those companies get off the ground and continuing to work full time for one was that having conversations with people and starting that earlier and backing up people that don't seem to have others willing to step out and talk with them. I'll never forget. I got involved in eye care because I tried to hook the CEO up with 10 other people like private equity consultants, angel investors. I just kept trying to introduce them to other people because I didn't have time and people would not take his meetings. So finally I was just like, screw it. <laughs> I will spend my nights helping you get this thing off the ground because I didn't, I, I, and at the time I didn't understand what was going on. I was just like, brilliant idea, brilliant CEO, brilliant founder, like thing makes business sense. Why isn't anybody helping? 
And so I ended up getting into a space that I probably shouldn't have been in that has gone really well, but because of that situation. So when people are in these silos, I think that if you go out of your way to help people that are trying to start things or do things and spend more time because things that we take for advantage, like I'm sure Dan, Trey, and myself, we just all have mentors that we call people that have been established in business for a long time. We can pick up the phone and call and be like, Hey, what do you think about this? Tell me about your experience. Well, what you find out really fast is that they don't, a, a lot of people of color or minority, they don't have that, right? They don't have that just built in innate network that they can bounce things off of. And so they don't understand how to navigate the politics all the time or what, you know, the finding or whatever it may be that we just take for granted. And so spending more time and having conversations and just recognizing what we can do is really helpful. And a lot of those conversations with my black friends have been like, I don't know what to do. I don't want to screw this up. And they're like, well, <laughs> you did the first thing, which is recognize there's an issue. So <laughs> don't worry about screwing it up. You're going to mess something up. But um, so have conversations, support people when, because you don't know if they got turned down by 10 other people when you're sitting down with them talking and, you know, encouraging and fostering the sort of conversations that we take for granted that oftentimes people just don't get to have. Trey, um, there are people on this call right now who are in all kinds of positions, whether it be leadership or, or they're working individual contributors inside of, inside of this. Um, can you give me your advice to them about, about how they can, they can walk forward into this journey on, on of course, on their, in their business and, and, and their everyday life, but also like you were talking about the grace that you need to, to move forward. Well, I mean, I, I can tell you and, and kind of explain how I, how I feel. Um, it may not work for everybody. You know, uh, it definitely won't work for everybody, but it, it could be a starting point. And for me, that was conversations with my black friends about, about their lives and how they're feeling. Um, that leads to research that led to, to getting to know um, the, a better understanding of history. I think I, I learned the difference between uh, history and remembering. Um, I think a lot of what I was, was taught and not, was not taught, you know, there was an absence and a gap there for what, what, what my brothers and sisters on my track and field teams had gone through and what their parents had gone through and what their grandparents had gone through. And then the, for myself, it is, it is a really hard task for, uh, I think us just as humans in general. And I think like, like Sam said, for just white a-holes to, to look at themselves in the mirror and say, you know what, this lens that I see the world through, it's just my lens. It, it, this is not how everyone else has seen the world. The constructs that, that brought me up and the way that I was raised and everything that I had seen, it's not how everyone else has seen the world. And I use the analogy of kind of a, a stained glass window and, and there's truth. And the truth is the sun. The sunlight is coming in and it's shining in these stained glass windows. And all of us throughout our lives are putting little, little colored tiles on these stained glass windows. And over the course of my white privileged life, I could put predominantly blue tiles. There could be some green in there. And so when the light shines on me as an adult, I see the light in this blue green shade, but someone with different circumstances, their whole life could be red and black, red and black, red and black, red and black, based on the way they're treated, uh, the way the educational system has, has treated them the way a job market treats them, the way media portrays them. All of those things are fed into how they see the world. And all of a sudden, what, what, I've, what I've had in myself as in a, a kind of an awakening is somebody, somebody picked me up and put me in front of someone else's stained glass. And I said, whoa, this is not the same light that I see. My, light, my light's way, way different. And, and that's not right. The, the difference here is not right. And I think what's really hard internally for myself and for people in general um, is to look at the differences and know that the disparity is not right. 
something can be done about this and whether that's lifting them up out through an internship, giving them a seat on the board. And I, I don't want to use the term giving, but providing a, a, an opportunity on a board to serve at a, or even serve at a C level. Um, those things will happen once everybody takes that individual look at themselves. Um, nothing's going to change in a business if the people running the business don't feel, don't feel that way. You know, then it's always going to feel like this is just an affirmative action thing. This is BS instead of, Hey, we've been doing it wrong. Hey, I'll step up and admit that let's do something moving forward that can make a positive change and make the world a better place after we're gone. Yeah. Sam, um, uh, we're going to, so uh, one second. Uh, so guys, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, I want to leave a couple of minutes for that. Um, and Sam, why don't why don't you go through and 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 if you had if you had a whole group of people sitting together, which you do, um, and you want to give you want to give them the you want to give them Sam's advice on on how to do this well. Um, knowing that this is a journey and, and it's going to take some time, but, but go ahead and, um, and, and give them your advice on how to, on how to move forward specifically in business as, as, uh, our generation really moves into that next level of, of, of finance and opportunity and, and CEO ship. Talk to the youth of America, Sam, make it happen, baby. Yeah. I, I think that, one of the things that has been most impactful for me is subordinating my ego to the fact that like, you know, there will be people in the room <laughs> that don't look like me that we need to get behind. And that doesn't, that may mean that I don't get a lot of credit or you don't get a lot of credit, but like truly to me, the only way to create change from what I've seen it is to make sure those people, whether it's have the money, have the connections, there's an insane amount of things that we can do just from a white guy standpoint to put the right people in places and get behind them. So whether it's those conversations of, um, you know, helping, like what is always staggering to me is that there a lot of white guys don't understand. We have a lot of people saying, you can do it. You can do it. You should go and do that. Right. One of the people I said that to is on the call and he went and created a really awesome tech company. And we were just commiserating how that's, that's not the same case for people of color or women. And so if there was kind of a three-step program and I've definitely not done this perfectly is, is that back those people that come to you with encouragement and mentorship and helping them move forward. Even if that means that you take a quote unquote, you know, less high profile position, um, to spend the time to help people of color and or women who are trying to start things and do things. Cause you know, you just don't know how many no's they've gotten and a lot, most of them gotten a lot. Um, and finally, when you're looking at your hiring and what you're doing, don't hire on the clothes and don't hire on hire on the talent and what you see. Like if they don't have the right Brown belt matching black shoes, none of that sh stuff matters, right? Like you gotta, provide the training and reinforcement and give people opportunities because um, I don't think I realized most of my life what it meant for somebody to come into an interview that was a woman or a person of color and how hard they had to work to get there versus maybe somebody like me that got an introduction in order to get that interview or from a young age. So that'd be my, kind of my three point plan, back people, help them, mentor them, and spend more time. And when they reach out to you, whether it's on LinkedIn or wherever, just take the meeting. Dan, um, as a leader of Notley, an investor, a guy who has got his hands on a lot of different things, um, I know a lot of people look to you for your opinion and your, and your guidance. And so don't feel the pressure, but feel the pressure. I want you to give, I want you to give the PSA. Uh, that saves the world. Um, tell everybody how, um, tell everybody what you see and what, and what can be next steps and what we do now, um, talking from, from your position to, to this group of 
business leaders and influencers? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think most people can do a lot more than they think they can at, at first, at first blush. And so, I mean, I, I would definitely encourage everyone to not just look at the things that are easy, you know, writing a check, showing up to a protest, but what, what is it that if you, if you, if you had it all on the line and you had to do something that was going to make a huge difference, what are all the really uncomfortable things, the really hard things, the things that would piss off people that you could do <laughs> instead and, and like create, create that spectrum for yourself. And then, you know, before you jump, jump in and make a, make a decision about what to do. Cause I think, you know, I, I, you know, I think we could all, we could actually do a lot more than we give ourselves credit for. And we make excuses and we rationalize ourselves away from the hard things that are either going to cause us pain, uh, especially things that are going to like demand that we give up some of our privilege. Uh, but we can all give up our privilege. We just don't want to mm -hmm. because privilege is nice. Um, and so what are the things that you can do that puts you in a really painful and uncomfortable position, but you could still do and use that as a, a, a framework and a benchmark for making decisions about how to move forward. Dan, what's the, what's the, what's the thing that you're doing? What is the thing that's causing you pain that you are the, the more give, give us an example. Yeah. So, um, the, the, the things that, that we're doing, um, you know, so we're promoting people into, into senior leadership positions. We're removing some people from leadership positions. We're, um, we're certainly writing checks and putting money behind those who are out there trying to make a difference who have proven, proven outcomes. We're um, taking a lens and looking at our own kind of investment portfolio and diving deep on our demographics and then now setting going to be setting benchmarks going forward in terms of the the demographics and makeup of that portfolio um in, in terms of who we're funding we're setting aside allocations of investment income that will not go to white people um, we're, we're demanding of ourselves that that uh, a large chunk of our money is going to be going into the into the pockets of on, you know, black entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of color um, we're launching um, and funding kind of internal programs like like Notley Tide and Notley Ripple um, that that are trying to move the needle and continue to push people. I'm having lots of conversations personally um, with my kind of peer network of CEOs, um, and so you know I think a lot of what we're doing is is that same analysis for ourselves of what what are we doing that's easy, what could we be doing that's really hard, and continuing to try to push ourselves up that spectrum of activity. But we're, you know, we're, we have a lot of work to do, um, you know, and we're, we're, we are doing some, but we aren't close to, to finish and we aren't close to uncomfortable enough. Well, Dan, Trey, Sam, um, you guys are, you guys are absolutely incredible. I appreciate, I appreciate you and everybody who's on this call. Um, these guys are on LinkedIn. They're, they're around, reach out to them say hello. Uh, one of the things that make them all so amazing is how accessible they are. Um, and uh, this today is only one piece of the puzzle. Um, we, this is the beginning of something, of something special. Just being a part of this call um, is, is really showing the world and showing yourself, showing your company that, that there are next steps that need to be taken. And why I partnered with Notley Tide is because of what they're doing after a call like this. It's not just about the one diversity training and then everybody checked the box and now we're, um, now we're happy, we're diverse now. No, it is actually about being able to to look through, look through your company, look through, look through your hiring practices, look through, look through the places that you're investing and be able to say, I want to do something different and here's my opportunity. And that's really why I partnered with Notley Tide to put this time, time together. And, uh, and some of the, some of the um, partners over at Notley Tide who've already begun to work on projects to inclusive hiring, volunteer opportunities, um, inclusive practice, practices inside your organization, um, 
our Elsewhere partners, Zen Business, Silicon, Val Silicon Labs, SailPoint. I mean, these are, these are big deal companies inside of our Austin ecosystem. And they, are, they have said, we're going we're, we're gonna to move the needle forward. And that's, and that's what this is about. Um, guys, I'm going to be uh, reaching out to a lot of you throughout, uh, throughout next week. And I'm also going to send an email with, uh, with notes from today and also tangible steps for every email that I have. If you are on this call and you haven't put your email, uh, I don't have your email, make sure to put it in the chat, chat box. And every email that I have, I'm going to get you information from the first session and the second session and keep you inside of the ecosystem so that uh, if, if you would like to um, push your company forward into uh, into really doing good and making it a more equitable space for for everyone uh i'm going to give you some opportunities like that uh there and help you help you walk into that and so so excited guys um of another one of these uh, we've actually got two more in this series we've got another one coming august 12th i'm going to get you guys the information as well and we're having uh brett hurt uh he's the ceo of data world and uh incredible guy business leader in in austin and uh brandon allen i'm really excited about that from txv partners um he's going to be on on the call too and and we're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna be we're gonna take the next step into the equity journey um and act actively promoting strategies for equity we're going to be talking about that and i know brandon's excited and brett's excited and i think we're going to have a uh, another panelist as as well and I'm gonna be sending copies of this uh, out it's gonna be on my website and we're gonna we're gonna put it on YouTube so that you guys can share it with your friends there were some very very powerful things that happened today with with our panelists and um, and getting people who have been able to take the time to look at who they are and their communities and and take a stance to make a difference is 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 super important. So um, I just want to thank you guys so much, Trey, Sam, Dan. You guys are you guys are great. Uh, I'm gonna just look in here and see if there were any other uh, questions. Um, and uh, I I appreciate you guys um, and uh, many much success in business and in, and in life and in Colorado too, Dan, um, appreciate you. <laughs> we all will talk later and all you other guys, everybody else on this call, um, reach out to me. I'm on social media. A lot of you on this have my phone number. Call me uh, if you need any sort of guidance. Um, I am I'm there for you um, and I can point you in the right direction to people who are actually who has spent years creating systems and, and helping companies work work forward into this. So Sam, Trey, Dan, much respect. We will talk soon. Later guys. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. You're pretty cool. <laughs> I will. Hey guys. Hey mom. Good job, son. Uh, Alec, uh, that was a great question. I'm sorry I missed that. Um, yeah, no, uh, all, all good. I put it in there late, but dude, this is yeah. awesome how you put this together. The thing was great. Yeah, one of the things that I that I've been toying with is actually uh, getting a uh, doing a separate panel from these four that only um, that only focuses on how you and um, on how you. Um, how you how you help black black owned businesses specifically in austin i yep. want to do it uh, geographically because everybody has their own challenges in different places and so how do we do that i'm going to get some 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 panelists who are doing it and then also some black business leaders and get them together and like what do we need to do on the tangible level what kind of because it's because of course it is it is about money and writing a check is huge but yeah, That's but hard. startups, 
is not is not what these communities need. They need opportunities within their local communities. And these venture capitalists are looking for 10x return. They're milking these businesses. Yeah. So it's not sustainable. I I got a lot to tell you. We've been looking a lot into this and tapping into other communities. Um, so I really do believe it comes down to services, meeting them where they're at, bringing the funds. Like it's yeah. it's both areas, time, money. <laughs> It's very right. intricate. So, and also most um, businesses of color are not online. No one's talking about that. Wow. So here, so. What I, we'll, we'll talk offline, but I want to connect you with the uh, Div Inc. Uh, CEO. Have you heard of Div Inc.? I have, yeah. Um, I, was got, I talked to him earlier this week and he's, some of the stuff that they're doing, they're actually doing an incubator right now for social justice and some of these things that we were talking about. The whole incubator is only going to focus on that. And um, he's connected to a lot of black owned startup businesses and can, I think it'd be a great chat for all of us to get together. I, I would love that. I, I really do believe small businesses is, is definitely a good way. Um, I tried the startup thing and having minimal expertise in that area and throwing those founders into that with this 10 X return mindset. It's not a good way to set them up. Yeah. So I love to talk to you more about this. Yeah. We'll, so. we'll talk yeah that sounds good. Bye mom. You did a great job. Thank you. Thanks man. Appreciate it. <laughs>